So hi, I'm, I'm Martin. I'm from Stockholm, Sweden. I just flew over uh, yesterday. Uh, but I'm actually moving over here in a month because the company I work for is opening an office here. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, you, you find, have my contact details here. If you want to know more about Patiktel, just Google us. But the company's product in, in that sense. The only thing you need to know for this talk is that we build a web app that helps people start and run online stores. So architectural evolution in startups uh, <laughs> was kind of a mouthful. I, I figured that if you're here, you weren't really scared away by that talk title. So I'll, I'll try to do that now. Uh, so software architecture is something that I think is very, it's an interesting topic because a lot of people I feel are, are kind of intimidated by it because uh, it's, it's a complex name. You don't really know what is included and what's counted as software architecture. But people really shouldn't be intimidated by it, and that's what it, I'm trying to fix. It's very important to think about, it's very important to consider, uh, but you have to remember one thing, and that is that it isn't static. It isn't something that you define once and then you have to live with for the rest of your life, or at least your career, or, or your project. It's possible to change, it's possible to improve. Oh yeah, sure. Maybe a, a bit more if it's possible, otherwise. If not, just leave it like this. Oh, maybe not like this. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Goes, goes. All right, that's fine. Thanks a lot. Okay, so like the lights in the room, uh, technical architecture isn't static. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just reading up my notes here. Yeah, so. The thing with architecture is that it should evolve. It should evolve with uh, your needs, as your, your business needs, but also your maturity, both as engineers and as an organization. So what works for like two hackers in a garage doesn't work for a 15-person startup, and what works for that startup won't work for the 150-person company or Google 30,000 people, right? So. Evolution is, is really important and it's really healthy. So you should embrace the fact that architecture, like everything else, needs to evolve over time. Uh, nobody gets everything right on the first try. And so by living with the problems of your current architecture and your current legacy code is what will help you figure out what to do about it to fix it. And if you're just sitting here thinking that you have everything under control and everything is perfect already, well, then I guess you just stopped evolving. So what I want to do today uh, isn't really to give you the, the one true way to design technical architecture. Uh, I don't know. just how you should approach it. I just want to tell you because I believe in, in concrete examples. Uh, I'm here like one person's preaching about how to do, go about it. So the, the only approach I took to this talk is when, when I started working uh, for, for the startup three years ago, what would I have wanted to hear? Because I've learned a lot of this the hard way. So <laughs> a long time ago in a country far, far away. That's actually three years ago in Stockholm, Sweden. So <laughs> we had a private beta. Uh, and, and this was very, very early days. It was even before my time, actually. We had about 100 users. That is 100 rows in the users table. I think we had 10 real stores that actually used the platform. And like everything else, you have 10,000 different things to do. So like code quality wasn't what was most important, and technical architecture def definitely wasn't. So just to give you like a quick look at about how it looked back then. This is the only screenshot I can find of the system, basically. So this was a single Tornado app that was responsible to, for everything. It did user signups, it did storefront checkouts, it did email delivery, it did image scaling, it did everything you need to run an online store platform, everything in the same code base and the same processes. So if you loaded a store with a lot of images, well, then your site was slower. And the front end was just a bunch of dumb web forms, maybe some jQuery client-side validation, if you, if you were lucky. 
So that's basically how it looked, and it looks really simple, and it was pretty simple, but everything everything was contained within that one tornado block, right? We host, we're hosted on Amazon. So one problem with, with this approach is, of course, that uh, when you're in the cloud, uh, responsiveness is a real issue. Like the uh, response time between your server and the client can be like 150, 200 milliseconds easily. And when you're doing this standard web web app, then you just have to wait a round trip to just do an interaction and wait for a new page to come back from the server. So that's terrible, right? So we have to change that for the next version, the public beta. Um, so there was a lot, of course, work here product-wise, but the technical change, the technical architectural change, was only one big thing that we did. And that was to introduce a smart client. So the smart client here was a backbone JavaScript model, or a bunch of models, actually. Uh, and the interesting thing with that is that that runs on the client's browser. So it takes input from this client, it contains internal state, and then sends it off to the server to sync. So you can get your users can get responses right away. So that was that was great. Like the real real improvement to what we had, although that doesn't tell you that much. So now I just have to go into the, the problem domain here a little bit. Like e commerce, like a lot of uh, domains, is, is pretty complex. Uh, and e-commerce especially has a lot of side effects and different things that needs to happen when, when things happen in the system. So you have things like when, when somebody buys something from a store, well, sure, you need to, to process that payment, but you also need to update the stock for the products they bought. You need to send email notifications. You need to update different metrics that we keep track of on like store performance, user performance, all of that stuff. And especially when we talk to a lot of external services because you don't have any control over their response time or even if they're up, right? So you have to send email, you have to process payments, all of that is on, on external servers under someone else's control. So the next thing we need, did was to introduce a way to do both event handling and other non-blocking tasks using a message queue and Celery. Most of you probably heard of Celery. It's one of the better Python frameworks. Uh, so what, what it does basically is that you have this message queue with queue, and whenever you have user interactions coming in from the internet, uh, it's published onto the queue. And they're published as messages that are just saying that, oh, this event happened with uh, some data connecting it. And then you have a bunch of workers that consume messages from the queue and actually do updates. So what that does is that you can give a lot faster feedback to your user, uh, but you can also handle failure more easily because if, for instance, you need to talk to the email delivery server and it's down, then you just retry the task again, right? So that was an improvement. Then just to give you a sense of like how this looks in code, the, the thing that was the most important for us was this event dispatching. So instead of saying when you process a checkout, hey, first I need to send an email, then I need to do this, then I need to do this, the code that, in this case, just creates a cart doesn't need to know about all the things that need to happen when you create a cart. You just publish the event saying, hey, we just created a cart. And then, in this case, the routes here are for uh, abandoned carts, which is one of those things. You probably have seen it. You get an email saying, hey, you left your cart when you don't complete checkout. So that's a feature you need in e-commerce. And these are the events that are interesting for that specific application. So that's a nice way to decouple different things of your code. Now, the interesting thing with this was that uh, if, if, if you use Celery or any similar type of system, you probably know that it, it teaches you a lesson very quickly about uh, distributed systems. Uh, and if you take in computer science, you learn this, but you didn't really understand the importance of it until you've seen it in production. So, I don't know, I, I, most of you may Maybe you can see the problem with this code right away, maybe not. But w what happens in a distributed system is that there's no guarantee about what happens when and in what order. So <laughs> in the beginning when we started publishing these messages, we had some is issues where, well, we create a card, right? And then we publish that event. It's pretty simple. You publish the event as soon as something has happened. But actually that's in a database transaction. So if the database transaction 
hasn't been committed at the time when you publish the event. It's possible that your message queue and your workers are faster than your publishing code is in actually committing the database transaction, which meant we got lots of interesting bugs mm -hmm. where, oh, so this worker is trying to process uh, an event for something that it doesn't really exist. How can this even happen? Uh, and, and this is, of course, especially a problem when you have a lot of legacy code, which you added on event dispatching on. So you just assume that, hey, I'm the only one working with this data. I can commit whenever I want. Well, not anymore. So those are just some gotchas to, to keep in mind, I think. Okay. E-commerce is uh, one of those domains where the, the number of potential features that a user would want is, is pretty much limitless. We very, very quickly ran into the problem where, hey, every, every one of our users wants a different set of different things. So you, wanna, you want different payment providers, you want to integrate with your accounting systems, you want some kind of marketing tool to send email newsletters, or you want those really, really annoying like exit intent pop-ups that you've probably seen. So just when you're about to close the browser window, it pops up saying, hey, wait, we got a 10% discount for you. It's called exit intent. They charge a lot of money for it, and apparently it works. Uh, but we didn't want to get stuck in, in that race, right? If you're a new e-commerce provider, you can't really win by just like sitting down and adding these features one by one. Uh, so instead, we the, the biggest technical thing we wanted to do was to introduce a way for third-party developers to extend our web app. Now, this is kind of interesting. Like, how do you let third parties extend the functionality of your own web app? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting issue. So the, the first thing that you need, of course, is, is an API, and that's kind of standard, right? It's a way for uh, some, someone's server to talk to your server and, and access your data, right? So we introduced uh, a new API layer, uh, which is a separate service, and it uh, talks directly to the third-party devs, and it's RESTful. So that's a really funny story. We, we had an internal API that our front end talked to, right? But uh, it was using something called JSON RPC. And if you haven't really heard of JSON RPC before, uh, that's fine because it just means that you haven't worked at Ticktail or Google. Uh, we're basically the only ones who use that protocol. Oh, you use it? Yeah. Awesome. Axial. Oh, cool. All right, we're three people now. We can share notes. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I come to a new city, nine million people, one person using it. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it, it has its benefits. Uh, basically what it does is that REST, while REST actually uses HTTP as the application protocol, JSON RPC is a layer on top, so HTTP is only the transport. And it allows you to do things like batching requests, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a really nice thing to use if you control the client and you control the server. But we wanted to let like any anyone who's used on um, you knows basically what an API stands for. One should be able to build something on Ticktail. So we 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 had to bite the bullet and actually build a RESTful API. It was really nice. So the second part is is kind of more interesting, although it's not as related to Python. So this is uh, a screenshot of an old version of our dashboard. So this is running on TikTok.com, but the main part of this screen is actually an iframe that's connected to a third-party devs server. So we're in our dashboard running the UI from somewhere else and then communicating using post message, which is a really, really weird way to send messages between frames in the same page. So you have the API in the back end, and then the front end has this UI toolkit, which is basically just a reskin bootstrap that lets you build a UI that looks like TikTok. So now people could just, using their standard web dev tools, they could build features that were displayed in the same way that, that our features were, which we thought was pretty cool. So now, it's, this is about a year ago. So we've, we've launched, we have, I think at this point, around 10,000 users. We 
we start getting into the issues where, okay, we've fixed like all the big feature problems. Now we need to scale, not just scale technically, we need to scale organizationally. So you're adding more people, you raise some funding, and, and you have to work together on, on different things. So just expanding features into this monolithic tornado app, which you saw in the beginning, wasn't really going to cut it. Uh, so we believe in, in splitting functionality into separate services. It's used to call service-oriented architecture. It's now called microservices. It's probably going to be called something else next week, but it's basically just taking different types of functionality and separating it into different services so they have less concerns. And for us, this wasn't an, uh, an idea where we wanted to have like an organizational split. We didn't want to have like, okay, so this team is responsible for this part of the code and this team is responsible for this. Everyone at Tiktel is allowed to change anything else on, on the platform. It was only mostly a mental thing. It's much easier to understand some a piece of code if you don't have to think about everything else that the platform is doing. Just reducing the amount of complexity you have to keep in your head at once. So as an example, what we needed to do was to just, uh, we need to introduce some image functionality. So um, we needed to, uh, before when we launched, we just scaled images. We wanted to crop them too and do some other things to them. So that was a good opportunity for us to take, uh, to build a new service. So we introduced a Flask and Givent uh, media server. The only thing it does is talk to S3 and rescale and do image operations and, and that's it. We got rid of all the code from the Tornado app and, and that piece of code is now running happily in this little corner and we haven't touched it in, in a couple of months at least. So we also did build a new version of our checkout. And this is of course a much more complex type of app. So it's actually split into two different services. There's a Flask backend that uses a new data store with Postgres, because when we launched there wasn't a way to get Postgres on Amazon RDS. So we're really happy about being able to use that now. Uh, and a node app that just runs on the server side and the front end side to talk to the order service and our RESTful API to actually figure out like what, how to display a cart to the user and, and ask them for the information that they need to actually complete the purchase. So now we're about at this, this place. There are a few different things that I didn't want to clutter up this, this graph with, but as you can see, it's a lot more complex than, than when I started out. Um, because this is where we started uh, two and a half years ago. And uh, it, this looks really simple, but really it was just stuffing a lot of different things into that single box in the corner, or in the center there. But what you need to remember is that we managed to grow the product and expand the architecture from this to this uh, and growing the team by about 15 people and growing the user base from like those 100 initial users to north of 50,000 now without going for this, you know, the big rewrite. The let's, we're so tired of our architecture, we're so tired of this old code, let's just throw it out a lot and start, a, start over again. again. This is, this is the dream, I think, of every developer that has legacy code, that, like a personal project or whatever. You open it up six months later and you think that, hey, if I could just do it all over again, it would be so much better. But as we all know, if, if you're more than one person working on something, that's, that isn't really an, an option, right? So the alternative way to do it is to just to think about, like, okay, what's, what's the easiest thing that we can do to just get something out the door? Uh, and then just remember to make it slightly, slightly better every single day. So instead of letting your frustrations with your current stack just grow and grow and grow until you want to just want to throw it out and rewrite it and go or whatever, <laughs> had that argument. <laughs> uh, just just remember, that, okay, so it's, it's under your control. Uh, it's it's your code. You can do whatever you want with it. Of course, you should structure work so it's easy to or easier to make these kinds of architectural changes. So tests are really great, and it's, it's nice to do decouple things, but, but it's possible to improve almost everything. 
I'm not sure if, if you're writing like a Visual Basic type of thing, but, but if you're on Python, I, I promise you it's, there's a path forward that makes sense and that uh, gets you a bit closer to your ideal. And the good thing about ideals is that once you're there, then you're going to have something that you're not going to be happy with that either, right? It's going to be a bit further ahead. So get something out the door. Uh, every day, try to consider, like, how can I leave this code a little bit better than how I started with it? And over time, that works wonders with your stack. So that's it. Uh, thank you for, for listening to me. I hope you was wasn't probably what you expected, but I hope it was useful anyway. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if you, if you want. No one has any questions. Sure. So you, you, it looked like you had a bunch of different like Flask apps running kind of. Yeah. How are they all running together? like? Yeah. On different subdomains or something, or uh, no? Actually, I, I I considered how far in the rabbit hole I should go, but what we do is that we have everything. We have an HA proxy or a couple of HA proxies running, and they are responsible for routing people to different apps. So all the traffic flows through the HA proxy, and it knows about which servers are responsible for which services and which are in traffic and which which aren't. And there's like an external host name for external traffic and an internal host name for internal traffic. Yeah. So. Sure. Uh, could you talk a bit, um, if you maybe a bit more about, uh, at the beginning you had everything in one single database and now you have multiple data stores. Yeah. How do you make sure you keep everything uh, in sync or how do you keep integrity there? Yeah. Uh, so the, the split bet into multiple databases wasn't a like a scaling thing, it wasn't that we wanted to shard, we, we don't want to have that need. It was mostly like a data, uh, like the same thing with code, right? We have this one database now that contains order data and it only needs to know about that. So it's concerns there. So it, it's pretty, in that sense, it's just sharded by something like that. So as long as that the service that works with orders is the only thing accessing that database, there isn't really much. Uh, then we have, we pull everything into like different analytics systems to do that kind of work with it. But whatever server just works with, with its data. Uh, and as long as that's internal, the system as a whole works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I guess my question was, yeah. like, you know, it's data, uh, an order belongs to a customer, but the sure. customer information isn't in the order. Table, yeah. It isn't in the order database. Yeah. You can't really key to it. Uh, is that, does it. Has that ever been a concern? Well, uh, not really, because what you want to make sure is that you have you have some local data for for the order. So, for instance, an order doesn't really have a, a, it has a customer in the sense that it has a shipping address that was what was valid at the time the order was made, and then there, the service knows that this is actually a user in, in this other service. And it can refer to that, but that's application logic, not not in the database. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Sure. It's more on the side of the team and how you guys. Yep. Like, how, what was the size that you went from like starting a number of developers to where you are today, and then around that, the size that you are today, how difficult it is to kind of get a consensus among those people to make these decisions going flat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really interesting question, and, and I, I was wondering how, how deep I should go into it on a, in a programming language conference. But what we've been going through now is that we, like in the beginning, the, the initial V1 was built by one person. Uh, and then we, we're now 15 engineers. We're probably going to be 25 before year end. Uh, so there's definitely a concern about uh, growing the team. So what we managed to do is that one of the things with, with service-oriented architecture or microservices or whatever is that it also helps a lot with structuring your teams. Because what you can do is that we have small autonomous team with two or three engineers and a designer, and they work on a one at a time. Completely open. They make all the technical decisions for it. They're responsible for keeping them running. They're responsible for, uh, for the architectural decisions. So as long as everything can work in sync on TikTok.com, 
then you're free to, for instance, like you saw someone using Node. That's totally fine if you can make an argument for it. But, but it's up to the team itself. So you're only ever two or three people having those arguments instead of being 20 people sitting around and, and discussing whether or not Flask or Django or, yeah, nobody's ever going to argue for Django. But, so. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I think you did talk about this at yeah. some point that you're saying that there was people centered on their tasks, so their part of, or their particular application. Yeah. So it sounds like in general, there was, there was less of concern that you had similar architectures and similar standards, I guess, so people could switch amongst these applications. So it was more, the, the yeah. priority was more allowing people to center on one thing. And yeah, well, I think that, so it's important to note here that there's no organizational barriers between moving between teams, uh, but we definitely haven't had the problem where you actually uh, have to retrain people in that sense and uh, th I think that this it's because we try to be really careful about who we hire and that people actually like learning new things it's also that we're a young company of course that it's it's easy for people to, to move across teams. there's only uh, <laughs> like a few teams to move between sure uh, and like I said it's uh, probably something that we have to revisit when we get to 150 people but for right now it works pretty well so they're showing me a sign that I'm out of time but if anyone has a last single question. <coughs> All right, awesome. Thank you so much for listening.